So one of the more interesting traditions in the study of language is um, the German philosophical tradition that dates back to the mid to late 1700s that really does start out with uh, Herder and Herder's uh, on the origin of language. And then this subsequently, you know, Herder was the teacher of Goethe, and then this tradition subsequently we can find through Nietzsche, and it does go into the work of Heidegger. And so what I want to do is just talk a little bit about Herder's work and maybe trace some of that development as it went into Nietzsche, and then finally as it culminates into the early work of Heidegger. Now, for people who are interested in the continuities between humans and the rest of the natural kingdom, uh, Herder's work is just, a, this is such a fascinating and interesting essay. It was published in the late 1700s. And what Herder is trying to do is to identify how humans and language are basically the same thing. And he's trying to articulate that within a, a natural account of the senses and to try to deal with what the relationship is between the world that the organism experiences and the particular sensory aptitudes that that organism has. And basically what he's suggesting is, he says, the more varied the activities and tasks of an animal, the more diffuse its attention and the more numerous the objects of it, the more unsteady its way of life. In short, the wider and more varied its sphere the more we note that its power of its senses are dispersed and weakened. And so he's doing this study of the difference between perceptual acuity, which I guess gives a very keen attention and very precise artifacts of that organism, and then the multivaried sort of openness that some organisms have and that it ultimately culminates into the statement where he says, the narrower the sphere of an animal, the less its need for language. And so I guess basically he's trying to suggest is that language itself is suited for that organism whose relevancy to the larger world is most opened or plastic or malleable that other creatures, due to their very perceptual acuity, are installed within a local and highly uh, inflexible relevancy structure. Now, partly one of the ways to get at how this relates to language is to try to address the degree to which language opens us in history and makes us become the kinds of creatures who only can be, um, I guess, solidified into the creatures they are with the help of history. I mean, I don't want to call a herder a kind of early social constructionist, but there is a sense in which for herder, we're born naturally historical. We're born into the condition of needing others to help us learn language, and language is itself a socio-historical phenomena but it's, it's part of reason, and we're reasoning beings, but it's not, that some, it's not like a language instinct. Instead, he's trying to deal with the problem of historicity in nature itself. Now, one way to get at this, and I wanted to just share this with people, this is a, a short little quotation from Nietzsche in his book, Unfashionable Observations, and it's Nietzsche talking a little bit about how language itself transforms our experience of mind and how it changes our experience uh, to the past and the way that we experience time itself. What Nietzsche writes here is, observe the herd as it grazes past you. It cannot distinguish yesterday from today, leaps about, eats, sleeps, digests, leaps some more and carries on like this from morning till night, from day to day, tethered by the short leash of its pleasures and displeasures, by the stake to the moment. And thus it is neither melancholy nor bored. It is hard on the human being to observe this, because he boasts about the superiority of his humanity over animals, and yet looks enviously upon their happiness. For the one and only thing that he desires is to live like an animal, neither bored nor in pain, 
Yet he desires this in vain, because he does not desire it in the same way as does the animal. The human being might ask the animal, Why do you just look at me like that, instead of telling me about your happiness? The animal wanted to answer, Because I always immediately forgot what I wanted to say, but it had always already forgotten this answer, and hence said nothing, and so that the human being was left to wonder. Now, in this passage, we find Nietzsche talking about the difference between the experience of language and the lack of language and how language itself opens us to thought, to contemplation, to wonder, to history itself. It frees us up from the moment. Now, one of the ways that this gets picked up, I think, in just somewhat brilliant form, is in Heidegger's book called The Fundamental Concepts of Metaphysics. This was a book that was done early on in Heidegger's career, and I think these now released early writings of Heidegger are very informative for people. They're unlike being in, noth or unlike being in time where Heidegger, I think, is a little bit more formal in his, uh, in his exegesis and here we find more coarse lectures and notes where he's trying to give examples and illustrations. And, and yeah, these were uh, basically a collection of lectures from 1929 and 1930. What we find in here is Heidegger describing what he calls the disinhibiting ring of an organism. Each organism is sort of surrounded by a disinhibiting ring. And the disinhibiting ring is a structure of relevance that only allows certain items to enter into experience depending upon the pre-given relevance to that organism. One of the examples that he has in there is of a silkworm and the silkworm's retinal image and it's, it's coming out of this Von Exel's work in biology as well, but they, they go in and they look at the retinal image on this silkworm and they discover that on the retinal image is, they can see it, is a reflection of a cathedral that's, I guess, must be coming through the window and they can see the cathedral on the retinal image of the silkworm's eye. And then the question that Heidegger wants to ask is, does the silkworm see the cathedral? Answering, or at least, does it see the cathedral as the cathedral? You know, I think Heidegger is going to say, no, it doesn't. Uh, it's not the problem of, is there something there to be seen? It's the question of, would the disinhibiting ring of the organism allow that cathedral, as cathedral, to enter into experience? Now, I think it's not, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist here to see the continuity between Herder and Nietzsche and, and Heidegger here. There seems to be some sense in which the perceptual acuity of other organisms renders them, and the fixed relevancy structure, it sort of renders them into a pre-specified relationship with their larger environment. And that's very different than what it means to be human. To be human is to be open, it's to be plastic, it's to fall into history, and that history itself is part and parcel of what we mean by reason, it's what we mean by language. Uh, it changes the relevancy structure uh, for humans. Uh, to be human isn't to have prescribed relevancies, or if they are, they're much more fluid and they're much more multivaried than the relevancy structures of other organisms. Other organisms can make things relevant to them only with so much variation, whereas to be human is to be so varied that things can enter into your experience even though you're not yet sure how they're relevant, and you can create new relevancies from those things. Well, I hope that some of that helps people get a handle on uh, some of the ideas from Herder and from Nietzsche and from the early Heidegger. Thanks.